a pleasure to speak to you. Thanks for being so patient. I was at an international conference once when, at the end of a very long day like that, the chairperson, whose first language wasn't English, had to introduce the final speaker, and he started his speech by saying, and now it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, least but not last, Professor Smith from Oxford University. So I do rather feel that the eminent speaker today, I am certainly least and definitely last. Okay, I want to talk about biodiversity net gain. I want to persuade you that you don't actually know what biodiversity net gain means or what it implies because nobody seems to at the moment. So let's have a look at the concept first of all. What is it? How is it measured? Does it work globally? How is it being applied locally in England? There are some earlier doctor experiences we can talk about. And then the ARC Environment Group promises to save nature across the ARC. Let's look at some of those. And finally, I want to give an example of a real building site on a greenfield site east of Aylesbury, which shows you some of the mess that we're getting ourselves in, in the name of greenwashing, which is what it is. So let's have a look at first of all what it is. You have to remember that biodiversity net gain is what we need to do. It's the last chance saloon to stop damage. And what we've got to do to begin with is to try to stop damage in the first place. So essentially, we have to avoid damage or mitigate damage or enhance what we've got. And then as a final stage, if we can do none of that, we then have to look at biodiversity net gain. And there are three scenarios on this slide from DEFRA explaining three different situations. First of all, we've got a building site represented by the one tree. And after development, we've got four houses and we've got two trees on the same site. So you can see we've got a net gain of one tree. This is called on-site offsetting. We actually ended up with more biodiversity. We started with within the building site. This is going to be a quite unusual situation, I think. Scenario B, here's the wildlife area first. We build four houses, but we end up with two trees. So we've got fewer trees, less biodiversity, than we had to begin with. So we have to do some offsetting. We can't do it on-site, so we have to do it off-site. In this case, we've got a sort of reed bed and some more trees. So collectively, we end up with more biodiversity on-site and off-site than we had to begin with before the concrete got poured. And then scenario C is, well, we'd like to do this, or the developer would like to do this, which needs to be close to the development, otherwise people experience all the pain and none of the gain of offsetting. But in some places, there's a shortage of land nearby the building site, so in that case, the developer pays a tariff, goes into a national fund, and nationally we decide somewhere to increase biodiversity elsewhere, in Scotland, for example, maybe even abroad, which means certainly local people do see all the pain of this and none of the gain of that. So this is not a very good outcome from the point of view of local development. Okay, so you've run through the sea scenarios. And for the Oxcam Arc, in fact, for anywhere, if you don't allow development in one place, you will get no funds for nature, you will get no funds for net development anyway. So this is tying saving nature with development. It's a dreadful Faustian pact. Basically, it's a quid pro quo. You must allow us to pour concrete, otherwise we won't finance saving nature somewhere else. It's a dreadful, dreadful pact. It's a bit like uh, taking Westminster Abbey, a wonderful, beautiful structure. These are our ecosystems basically reducing it to a rub, uh, load of rubble to build houses on it, moving that load of rubble elsewhere, the wildlife, the trees and so on, and saying, well, it's the same. We've moved Westminster Abbey. We have moved Westminster Abbey, but we've destroyed the structure in the process. And it will take hundreds of years for natural ecosystems to grow up to the real Westminster Abbey, and in the meantime, all the thousands of species relying on that habitat will have disappeared, will have died. How is it measured? Well, under the new environmental bill, uh, the new environmental bill requires 10% net gain on all development sites. Uh, okay, so you say, well, 10% net gain of what? What is being measured? And at the same time, DEFRA is producing something called a biodiversity metric. It allows us to put a number on biodiversity. In, in more Littman's place, it, it turns natural history into an ology, because an ology needs numbers. We've got numbers here. But the difference is the detail. What, in fact, is the biodiversity metric measuring? What we would like it to measure is the abundance uh, and the different species number of all the species in the ecosystem. That would take far too long, be far too expensive. So in fact, what the metric does, it takes natural habitats. It looks and classifies natural habitats into one of about 128 different sorts of woodland or grassland or hedgerows or uh, marshes. And then it associates that with a biodiversity number, and hedgerows are more diverse than, say, cornfields. And so you add up all the numbers of all the different habitat units, and then you say that is the metric, that's the biodiversity units of the site in question. 
So we're using habitats as a proxy for real biodiversity. Quite frankly, I was spent my sort of life teaching ecology. Habitats are a very, very poor proxy for most biodiversity. But it's a quick and quick and dirty method of measuring it. Now, the real problem with biodiversity net gain is actually it involves a loss. And I can give you the example. It needs to separate the concept of yields and stock. And we can do that by imagining of two fields next to each other. We're going to develop the left-hand field, and we're going to put the net gain requirements of the environmental field in the right-hand field. So the developer comes along, buys field one. Um, to begin with, both field one and field two have the same biodiversity units. It's 100 units in each field. A developer buys field one, fences it off, and digs up the ground and concretes it over, and then it, it builds houses all over it, the entire field one, so we've lost 100 biodiversity units from site one. There's a requirement in the environmental building to have a 10% have a net gain of the units you've lost. So the developer has to somehow provide 110 units on this site in order to compensate for the loss that the house has brought about. What does he do? He phones up the local environmental NGO, BVAD or RSPB, and says, look, you've got to help me. I've got to improve the biodiversity yield of field one in order to make up the losses of the, on field two, the losses on field one. And I've got to add a 10% gain because that's required to the bill. Now, if this is successful, at the end of the day, we had 100 units on this field, compensated for 100 units on this field, and we got the 10% extra. So we've got 210 units on this field. We have achieved the environmental requirement, the particular requirements. But look what we've done. Because the biodiversity units are equivalent to the yield, if you think of the yield of a fishery. And the soil on which they grow is the stock. And think of the stock of fisheries. And the experience of fisheries is very important here because we've overfished fish stocks. If you take a yield out of fish stocks too much, you work the stock that's left, which reproduces each year to give it the yield next year. You overwork the stock so much, the stock begins to collapse, and then your yield collapses. And that's what will happen here, because we're expecting a greater and greater biodiversity yield from a smaller and smaller stock. Because we've ended up with half the stock to grow all that yield, and the other half of the stock is lost to us forever. It's beneath the concrete of the building site. So it's a bit like a magician saying, look, here's some magic here. I'm going to give you 10% gain at the same time he's using the other hand to steal your wallet, because that's what's happening. We're using stock, which we could be using to grow biodiversity in the future, in order to build houses. Does it work globally? What's happened in the UK, we don't have much experience in BNG, biodiversity net gain. And you'll see there are statements that say, well, it's easy, just crank the hand and we get the gain but, that, that I've shown on the pictures. It's not like that. And in fact, if you look at the global experience, it's been tried for decades in other places, and you can read the results here. It's not worked in many places. In Australia, it's calculated you need 146 years, a rather precise number, to re re replace the biodiversity loss from a building site. We've got limited experience, a few offset sites from 2012 as part of a DEF project. It, it, it produced some rather equivocal results, but very recently, the Durham Institute of Conservation Ecology at the University of Kent have surveyed the global experience of BMG. They looked at something like 16,000 publications across the world. They identified actually relatively few with data before and after the development so that you could assess how much was gained and lost. And these are the results. So this is the result of the global experience of BMG practice. And in one third of the examples, and they were looking at no net loss, so neither improvement or loss of biodiversity, rather than biodiversity net gain. In one third of the global projects, they achieved the objective of no net loss, no harm to nature. But in two thirds, they didn't. One third definitely failed, and another third, the outcomes were so equivocal, you couldn't say whether you uh, had no net loss at all. So that experience is that we're not very good at no net loss, and we're certainly not very good at biodiversity net gain, and countries much more experienced than we have have failed to, to crack this particular problem. The environmental group of the art leaders group is going gaily ahead saying we're going to achieve all these uh, benefits, uh, not a problem. We, we know the science, we can do it. Uh, it's just not true. And Dieter Helm, the chair of the uh, Natural Capital Committee, now replaced by the Office of Environmental Protection, said no one has yet achieved net environmental gain at scale. The projects have been quite small. 
Five counties are 11,000 square kilometers. No risk achieved, uh, even no net loss at that sort of scale. We saw the chance of net gain success is one in three from the global study, so I ask you a question. Would you let a loved one of yours go in for a major surgical operation in which two thirds of the patients died? Because that's the choice being given with biodiversity net gain, in which more examples fail than succeed. How is it being applied in England? Well, the same group that looked at the study of biodiversity net gain globally looked at the early adopter experience in England. Some local councils are requiring builders to try to get net gain on sites. What was the result of that study? 95% of biodiversity units delivered in the sample come from habitats within or directly adjacent to the development footprint. What they're saying is that 95% of the examples were on-site offsetting. Now what you're saying is that we can get a we can buy a field, we can build houses, and then on what's left of that building site, we can improve the biodiversity. It's not going to happen, quite frankly, because people who live close to wildlife sites will trample them. The dogs will go and foul the area, the cats will go and kill the birds. It won't work. 95% it means that only 5% of the early adopter experience is with off-site offsetting. And when you go into the DEFRA reports, even DEFRA expected 75% of offsets to be on-site. Yet the environmental bill says virtually nothing about on-site offsetting. It bangs on about off-site offsetting, about covenants for 30 years to protect the offset sites. It says virtually nothing at all about 95% of building sites which will go for on-site offsetting. And of course, when you do on-site offsetting, who is the judge and jury? It will be the builder. The builder won't employ B about to do his on-site offsetting. He will be the judge, jury, and executioner of his attempts, his attempts at biodiversity net gain. And those gains have got to be assessed over the last 30 years. Chris mentioned the statistic that most building companies in the UK have fewer than three employees. The other statistic about building companies in the UK is that they go bankrupt at an alarming rate, especially the small ones. So small companies won't exist across the 30 year time span to assess whether or not they uh, achieve the net gain they're required to achieve. So it's basically an excuse to greenwash a development as usual agenda and it is set up to fail the way that we designed it in the first place. And they're highlighting the governance gap. The governance gap referred to there is the gap in the environmental bill, which, as I said, is almost totally silent about on site offsetting. Our environmental group promises. Okay, so we've got our environmental group, and uh, here's a report there. We've got Councillor Bridget Smith, who's the chair of the Arch environmental group, and Councillor Bridget Smith tells us look at it carefully. Sustainable economic growth, so it's what they want when they develop the art, and the enhancement of the environment are compatible and achievable. You can have it all. It's Boris's cakeism. You can have your cake and you can eat it. Let's have a look at that. Let's take data from one of the major groups involved in developing art. This is the England's Economic Heartland. It's developing the transport strategies across the art. That's roads and railways to join up all the houses they want to build all over the place. And this is a very busy graph, but this is a single graph that sinks that idea monumentally. So England's Economic Heartland produced this. They were looking at, in fact, 19 road corridors, those oblongs on that map there, there's 10 of them. Here's a list of the 19 corridors. So the Oxford Milton Keynes corridor is the very top one there. And then across the top are the various factors you have to consider when you plan roads. And in this case, they're not building new roads, they're simply enhancing most of the existing roads. So those are the road corridors, and these are the sustainability appraisal topics. So what you've got to look at before you start to build the road. And without looking too much at the details, but basically across the top here, we've got, um, we've got uh, uh, does it conform to the local plan? What about the economic output? Uh, what about the uh, uh, local plan um, employment sites? Sorry, misread that, employment sites. And if the cell here is green, it means that that development is good for that factor, okay? So if you enhance these roads, Look at the things which are uniformly green. This one is the local plan. It's effectively housing, economic activity here, and this third one here, employment. These corridors are good for the things they want to de develop across the art. Houses, employment, jobs, etc., etc. Everything to the right here is the things that actually want to preserve. We've got, for example, uh, a 
special areas of conservation, we've got SSSIs, we've got Bram sites, very special sites here, we've got carbon storage, we've got water, we've got AOMBs, the whole lot here. We've even got air quality, climate change, so on and so on. If the cell is red here, it means the development of this road corridor would be bad for these factors. Now, looking at it from there, you can see basically the development of these road corridors will be good for everything that the developers want to happen in the arc. It's good for business, it's good for profit, and it will be bad for everything else. So the environment and the economy are not compatible, according to, uh, in direct contradiction to what Bridget Smith was saying. You cannot have it all. You really can't have it all. There's some very difficult choices to make, and they are not being made yet across the arc because they're not yet being acknowledged as problems of development. They're saying we can have it all, we cannot have it all. So roads are good for a housing, economic activity and jobs, and they're bad for everything else. So they're not compatible. Finally, I want to give you some earlier, it's really depressing, the last bit of this talk, a terrible way to end a, a session like this. I want to show you the experience of an ENGO collaborating with a building company producing what they call a, a building site which is good for wildlife. And it's this area here, you've all baritones and David Wilson. I don't particularly want to single them out because this is happening up and down the country, but it's about the Kingsbrook site. It's a flagship site for the RSPB that helped Barrett build these sites in a greenfield site east of Aylesbury. So we've got the border of Aylesbury here, we've got the site which will be developed, which is around here, uh, Broughton and sort of west, east and north west, east of that. And it was greenfield sites in 2003. When I press the button, you're going to see Landsat images of these years, and the years will come up in the top right. You will see the building site being developed from a greenfield site. So what happens, we've got 2006, I think it's 2017, the first batch of houses here, 2020, and then there's a much more recent one, it's June of this year. You can uh, do it again, because this is really quite depressing. This is what we do to our greenfield sites. And what I'm going to do now is to show you some publicity photographs from the builders, and indeed from the RSPB, who is very proud of their collaboration with the builders in this case. So it's king. It is the future of residential living. It's the sort of thing that sort of Chris hinted at. This is what developers are doing. And if you're interested, introducing King's work, a wildlife friendly development. Let's see how wildlife friendly they reckon wildlife friendly needs to be. Well, here's one picture of the site. It's a pretty standard building site. And then if you look around, you'll see a thousand bird boxes, grace uh, uh, of the RSPB. And they pull out all the stops here. You've got back roofs. These are special back roofs built into the end of houses. They're probably plastic. And then you've got hedgehog highways. If you drill a hole in a fence, you can call it a hedgehog highway. In fact, there aren't any hedgehogs around. It's not a deal there. It's a hedgehog highway. <laughs> and then swift bricks. Well, swift needs holes to nest in, so there's another different shaped plastic brick. This is, this is a flagship project for an EMGO that's sort of, as Alan suggested, getting into bed with developers because that's where their money comes from. And this, these are little concrete cups, which are sand martin nests. Now, no self-respecting sand martin will accept a nest made of concrete, for heaven's sake. But you can buy these on the RSBB site. You can screw them to the wall of your house. This is an insult to the intelligence, even of Hasmardens, let alone anything else. And then the other great boast is that in Kingsbrook, 60% of the development is allocated to open space. In other words, not going to the Victorian slums of yesteryear, the thing of the part, 60% of open space. What Kingsbrook don't tell you is that it's a standard planning rule that virtually 40% of the development site will be open space. It, that's the sort of minimum standard of a standard build. They're offering us 60%, it's a bit more. But let's see what that open space looks like, because they've built this damn thing already. If you look at it from an aerial view, that's what it looks like. Let's zoom in. Most of that open space is concrete and tarmac. There's a bit of green here, there's a few sort of trees there, but that's it. That's the 60% space that they're saying is good for nature. It's the very last thing that's good for nature. You wouldn't find a nightingale, even a bat in a place like that. This is greenwashing. Greenwashing is being used for a development as usual scenario by the builders. No question at all about that. Well, we have to call them out. The way to call them out is actually to say that BNG as a concept has, it will totally fail. It's set up to fail. 
we should divorce development from saving nature, we should go back to what John Lawton required in 2010, which is making space for nature. Lawton said, we need a billion pounds each year to save nature. But in Lawton's case, it had no developmental strings attached. We need a billion pounds a year to save nature, and you can go on with your development in the usual way. That's what we need to do now. That's what we need to do now. Uh, because what we see here is it's not good enough. It really isn't good enough what we're doing so far to save nature. So that's the end of the talk. That's what's going to happen to our five counters if we're not careful. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs>
uh, extra workers, then you could ask the question, well, is, well, how best do we house them and put them, and what sort of city do we create for them, or what sort of place do we create for them? Which is almost where, where it started with the Savills report of, what, three or four years ago. You know, how do we do this? But we may be needing to manage degrowth. Well, that's another interesting point. Nobody's talking about empty homes either, or the overseas investors. I don't know how many, somebody mentioned empty homes. I don't know how many empty homes there are in this area. Well, was it, 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 it 13,000? 13,000. Well, it's 2,000. The FT's done a series of articles on the Times Media on overseas investors who are not Interesting, overseas investors were not mentioned at all, much to my surprise. And I didn't actually meet anybody. Hong Kong is one of the biggest uh, destinations for Cambridge. But um, a couple of other things that did come up. There was a push to say that the ARC, the, the ARC is the R&D centre, and that therefore you need to develop things, but not necessarily produce them there. Although that's like, that's not all the jobs on. The, uh, there was a lot of push to say that this is about inventing places for your children and their children to live in, which of course ignores the fact that 75% of the homes in the plans that we have seen, I've actually intended for other people. Um, sorry, there was a third thing that came out. Um, oh yes, Harwell. I don't know Harwell from the back end of the bus, I'm afraid, but there was a description of it being the size of the city of London. But it was interesting that the people who were developing there were talking about developing that as a campus, and that what they had done, and I described it as they'd taken what had been an old-fashioned coronation strike street housing, if you like, with lots of community, you suddenly produced a new campus which is the equivalent to building a town block with no community, and what they had done was set up a residence association to produce the community that then worked within the campus. But it's a sensible thing to do, and that way you're getting cross-pollination between space and medicine and so on about how you share ideas. But you needed that something the size of a campus, not the size of the art to do that. And the next stage was, and we then need connectivity. And I said, well, where's the connectivity? And they said, anywhere you like in the UK or around the world. So again, actually developing that campus idea had nothing to do with the arc. So it's a perfectly viable, you know, it's a viable way of developing a business, but you don't need an arc to do it with. Yes. Just one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dave, you mentioned British Space. Yes. Uh, and I think you mentioned British Space. Yes. What I know, opponent, maybe. Very interesting lady because she's a Liberal Democrat. Mm. She's leader of South Camps District Council. Yeah. Our local Tory MP, mm -hmm. Anthony Brown, has right. been trying to get her and her council to reduce housing numbers okay. in South Camps. Yeah. She refuses. Mm. She seems to be totally behind the arm. Mm. She was elected on the basis that the Liberals didn't want to do all the development as the Tories before them. Now, over in this direction, we've had a, a, a change of um, MP, mm -hmm. not all the development has gone on, to a Liberal Democrat. Yeah. The Liberal Democrat policy is green. Yeah. I'd like to find some way of putting some pressure from the party on mm -hmm. Bridget Smith. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, she, she is, she is the, essentially the spokesperson for the ARC environmental group, so yeah. she's, she's in a very different position. Well, one thing, look, before we speak, Paula, one thing about Bridget Smith, she's unique because I met somebody who's known her for about 20 years as a fellow counsel. She said, think about Bridget, she cannot tell a lie. She tells it as it is. She never lies to you. What she says is true. So when she says we're going to double nature across the arc, and you ask her, OK, Bridget, how are you going to double nature? She said, well, first of all, I don't know what doubling nature means. The second, I haven't got a clue how to do it. And I think that's true <laughs> on both counts. There's a question at the back. Um, your excellent uh, demolition of the housing estate, is there anywhere where we could go to find a program or a website where we could uh, plug the details of the plan, yeah. it's a road, a railway, or a housing yeah. estate, to get the uh, resulting uh, biological score of uh, uh, that's a good question. I think I think you would do. I mean, the, in fact, the Kingsbrook site, because it's so keen on, on the Kingsbrook site, that there's quite a lot of information on that website. And Barrett's has set up a website for Kingsbrook. Um, not necessarily detailed plans. So if you want to do something, say, on East West Rail, yes. to see what the uh, bio game 
yeah, as well. The, yeah, the other thing that the um, DICE study showed is that they actually sent a habitat description to a half a dozen professional ecologists to say, okay, which particular uh, habitat category would you assess it to be under the DEFRA scheme, which of the 128, and what quality do you think this habitat is? And there was huge disagreement between professional ecologists without any access to crime. It's just very, very poorly or badly defined. You will not get agreement amongst experts. And what developers will choose is the expert that assesses the biodiversity at the lowest level of the development, on the development side. And there's not a great deal you can do about that. No, we're really, are, we're really are a little bit pressure time because the, the, the room is needed. So can we make this the last question? Okay. Um, market for rules over your head. It's an investment proposition. This is why uh, market prices are so high in the ARC. And so overseas investors are actually buying up cases where they know the value will go up. In fact, on our website, Stop the Art website, in February of this year, the greatest number of overseas uh, visitors to our site were from Singapore. They are looking at the ARC to invest their money because that's going to go up. In terms of who's funding the ARC, it's a very important question. So in fact, I've been to the sort of developer conference Nick was being to, and the government spokesperson said, look, this is far too expensive for we, the government, to fund. These are business opportunities for you business people. You should fund it. And of course, the business people say, look, we're not going to put any of our money in there unless you pump prime some of the infrastructure across the yard. So they're waiting for a first mover in this. Will the government be the first mover and spend a fortune on it? Or will the developers probably wouldn't be the first mover because they're going to definitely lose out. So it's, it's almost a standoff. And if you think of what funded the Industrial Revolution, okay, 150, 200 years ago, it wasn't government. It was private money that funded the Industrial Revolution. And you could argue that development now should be private. It shouldn't actually expect too much government investment. And this is the argument of Jake Berry's Northern Big Bang. Jake Berry wants essentially an arc across the north. But he says, I don't need any government money. I need a bit of government enabling policy and then I can unleash a tsunami of private investment into my northern big bank. It's a completely different model. It's actually quite a scary model because it's a wild west of development. But it is much more akin to the Industrial Revolution than it is the Oxcam Arc, which is an artificial construct. Very interesting. Well, that's interestingly, the, the conference I was at was not expecting any government money in the near future. Not with the sort of, yeah. So, East West Rail, yes, obviously there are other projects, but in general they were not expect. you know, nobody was sitting there. They all kept saying we want a decision, we want some money, but I think realistically we weren't expecting. The answer on South Cambridgeshire is they're all up for election next year, including Bridget Smith, so that's an opportunity as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> but, but you see, there is, I mean, uh, although government isn't going to invest money, the government is going to set up an art growth body, which is above, very superior to the art leadership group that we were talking about today, and that will be a ministerial level group, or it's supposed to be a ministerial level group, to bang heads together in Whitehall to get some joined up thinking across the art, because at the moment there isn't really any joined up thinking between ministries about the ARC. So we look out for the ARC growth body, not yet constituted, and one of the early rumours is that the person in charge should be a ministerial level, should actually sit in cabinet. 
if the government's serious about the art. This is five important counties. This is sort of five, six percent of the. Big signal. We've got to. We've got to. We have to get out.